12. The Priest King Who Never Ruled Most people today speak of Christianity as if it were a single specific thing a coherent, homogeneous, and unified entity. Needless to say Christianity is nothing of the sort. As everyone knows, there are numerous forms of Christianity, Roman Catholicism, for example, or the Church of England initiated by Henry VIII. There are the various other denominations of Protestantism from the original Lutheranism and Calvinism of the 16th century to such relatively recent developments as Unitarianism. There are multitudinous fringe or evangelical congregations, such as the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses. And there are assorted contemporary sects and cults, like the Children of God and the Unification Church of the Reverend Moon. If one surveys this bewildering spectrum of beliefs from the rigidly dogmatic and conservative to the radical and ecstatic it is difficult to determine what exactly constitutes Christianity. If there is a single factor that does permit one to speak of Christianity, a single factor that does link the otherwise diverse and divergent Christian creeds, it is the New Testament and more particularly the unique status ascribed by the New Testament to Jesus, his crucifixion and resurrection. Even if one does not subscribe to the literal or historical truth of those events, acceptance of their symbolic significance generally suffices for one to be considered a Christian. If there is any unity, then, in the diffuse phenomenon called Christianity, it resides in the New Testament and, more specifically, in the accounts of Jesus known as the Four Gospels. These accounts are popularly regarded as the most authoritative on record, and for many Christians they are assumed to be both coherent and unimpunable. From childhood one is led to believe that the story of Jesus, as it is preserved in the four Gospels, is, if not God-inspired, at least definitive. The four evangelists, supposed authors of the Gospels, are deemed to be unimpeachable witnesses who reinforce and confirm each other's testimony. Of the people who today call themselves Christians, relatively few are aware of the fact that the four Gospels not only contradict each other but, at times, violently disagree. So far as popular tradition is concerned, the origin and birth of Jesus are well enough known. But in reality the Gospels, on which that tradition is based, are considerably more vague on the matter. Only two of the Gospels Matthew and Luke say anything at all about Jesus' origins and birth, and they are flagrantly at odds with each other. According to Matthew, for example, Jesus was an aristocrat, if not a rightful and legitimate king descended from David via Solomon. According to Luke, on the other hand, Jesus's family, though descended from the house of David, was of somewhat less exalted stock, and it is on the basis of Mark's account that the legend of the poor carpenter came into being. The two genealogies, in short, are so strikingly discordant that they might well be referring to two quite different individuals. The discrepancies between the Gospels are not confined to the question of Jesus's ancestry and genealogy. According to Luke, Jesus, on his birth, was visited by shepherds. According to Matthew, he was visited by wise men. According to Luke, Jesus's family lived in Nazareth. From here they are said to have journeyed for a census which history suggests never in fact occurred to Bethlehem, where Jesus was born in the poverty of a manger. But according to Matthew, Jesus's family had been fairly well-to-do residents of Bethlehem all along and Jesus himself was born in a house. In Matthew's version Herod's persecution of the innocents prompts the family to flee into Egypt, and only on their return do they make their home in Nazareth. The information in each of these accounts is quite specific and assuming the census did occur perfectly plausible. And yet the information itself simply does not agree. This contradiction cannot be rationalized. There is no possible means whereby the two conflicting narratives can both be correct, and there is no means whereby they can be reconciled. Whether one cares to admit it or not, the fact must be recognized that one or both of the Gospels is wrong. In the face of so glaring and inevitable a conclusion, the Gospels cannot be regarded as unimpunable. How can they be unimpunable when they impugn each other? The more one studies the Gospels, the more the contradictions between them become apparent. Indeed they do not even agree on the day of the crucifixion. According to John's Gospel, the crucifixion occurred on the day before the Passover. According to the Gospels of Mark, Luke and Matthew, it occurred on the day after. Nor are the Gospels in accord on the personality and character of Jesus. 
Each depicts a figure who is patently at odds with the figure depicted in the other's a meek lamb-like savior in Luke, for example, a powerful and majestic sovereign in Matthew who comes not to bring peace but a sword. And there is further disagreement about Jesus' last words on the cross. In Matthew and Mark these words are, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Luke they are, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And in John, they are simply, It is finished. Given these discrepancies, the Gospels can only be accepted as a highly questionable authority, and certainly not as definitive. They do not represent the perfect word of any God, or, if they do, God's words have been very liberally censored, edited, revised, glossed and rewritten by human hands. The Bible, it must be remembered and this applies to both the Old and New Testaments is only a selection of works, and, in many respects, a somewhat arbitrary one. In fact, it could well include far more books and writings than it actually does. Nor is there any question of the missing books having been lost. On the contrary they were deliberately excluded. In AD 367 Bishop Athanasius of Alexandria compiled a list of works to be included in the New Testament. This list was ratified by the Church Council of Hippo in 393, and again by the Council of Carthage four years later. At these councils a selection was agreed upon. Certain works were assembled to form the New Testament as we know it today, and others were cavalierly ignored. How can such a process of selection possibly be regarded as definitive? How could a conclave of clerics infallibly decide that certain books belonged in the Bible while others did not? Especially when some of the excluded books have a perfectly valid claim to historical veracity? As it exists today, moreover, the Bible is not only a product of a more or less arbitrary selective process. It has also been subjected to some fairly drastic editing, censorship, and revision. In 1958, for example, Professor Morton Smith of Columbia University discovered, in a monastery near Jerusalem, a letter which contained a missing fragment of the Gospel of Mark. The missing fragment had not been lost. On the contrary, it had apparently been deliberately suppressed at the instigation, if not the express behest, of Bishop Clement of Alexandria, one of the most venerated of the early church fathers. Clement, it seems, had received a letter from one Theodore, who complained of a Gnostic sect, the Carpocratians. The Carpocratians appear to have been interpreting certain passages of the Gospel of Mark in accordance with their own principles principles that did not concur with the position of Clement and Theodore. In consequence, Theodore apparently attacked them and reported his action to Clement. In the letter found by Professor Smith, Clement replies to his disciple as follows, You did well in silencing the unspeakable teachings of the Carpocratians. For these are the wandering stars referred to in the prophecy, who wander from the narrow road of the commandments into a boundless abyss of the carnal and bodily sins. For, priding themselves in knowledge, as they say, of the deep things of Satan, they do not know that they are casting themselves away into the nether world of the darkness of falsity, and, boasting that they are free, they have become slaves of servile desires. Such, men, are to be opposed in all ways and altogether. For, even if they should say something true, one who loves the truth should not, even so, agree with them. For not all true things are the truth, nor should that truth which, merely, seems true according to human opinions be preferred to the true truth, that according to the faith. It is an extraordinary statement for a church father. In effect Clement is saying nothing less than, if your opponent happens to tell the truth, you must deny it and lie in order to refute him. But that is not all. In the following passage, Clement's letter goes on to discuss Mark's gospel and its misuse in his eyes by the Carpocratians, as for Mark then, during Peter's stay in Rome he wrote, an account of, the Lord's doings, not however, declaring all, of them, nor yet hinting at the secret, ones, but selecting those he thought most useful for increasing the faith of those who were being instructed. But when Peter died as a martyr, Mark came over to Alexandria, bringing both his own notes and those of Peter, from which he transferred to his former book the things suitable to whatever makes for progress towards knowledge, Gnosis. Thus, he composed a more spiritual gospel for the use of those who were being perfected. Nevertheless, he yet did not divulge the things not to be uttered, nor did he write down the hierophantic teachings of the Lord, 
but to the stories already written he added yet others and, moreover, brought in certain sayings of which he knew the interpretation would, as a mystagogue, lead the hearers into the innermost sanctuary of that truth hidden by seven veils. Thus, in sum, he prearranged matters, neither grudgingly nor incautiously, in my opinion, and, dying, he left his composition to the church in Alexandria, where it even yet is most carefully guarded, being read only to those who are being initiated into the great mysteries. But since the foul demons are always devising destruction for the race of men, carpocrates, instructed by them, and using deceitful arts, so enslaved a certain presbyter of the church in Alexandria that he got from him a copy of the secret gospel, which he both interpreted according to his blasphemous and carnal doctrine and, moreover, polluted, mixing with the spotless and holy words utterly shameless lies. Clement thus freely acknowledges that there is an authentic secret gospel of Mark. He then instructs Theodore to deny it, to them, the Carpocratians, therefore, as I said above, one must never give way, nor, when they put forward their falsifications, should one concede that the secret gospel is by Mark, but should even deny it on oath. For not all true things are to be said to all men. What was this secret gospel that Clement ordered his disciple to repudiate and that the Carpocratians were misinterpreting? Clement answers the question by including a word-for-word -word transcription of the text in his letter, to you, therefore, I shall not hesitate to answer the questions you have asked, refuting the falsifications by the very words of the gospel. For example after and they were in the road going up to Jerusalem, and what follows, until after three days he shall arise, the secret gospel brings the following material word for word, and they came into Bethany, and a certain woman whose brother had died was there. And, coming, she prostrated herself before Jesus and says to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. But the disciples rebuked her. And Jesus, being angered, went off with her into the garden where the tomb was, and straightway a great cry was heard from the tomb. And going near, Jesus rolled away the stone from the door of the tomb. And straightway, going in where the youth was, he stretched forth his hand and raised him, seizing his hand. But the youth, looking upon him, loved him and began to beseech him that he might be with him. And going out of the tomb they came into the house of the youth, for he was rich. And after six days, Jesus told him what to do, and in the evening the youth comes to him, wearing a linen cloth over his naked body. And he remained with him that night, for Jesus taught him the mystery of the kingdom of God. And thence arising, he returned to the other side of the Jordan. This episode appears in no existing version of the Gospel of Mark. In its general outlines, however, it is familiar enough. It is, of course, the raising of Lazarus, described in the fourth Gospel, ascribed to John. In the version quoted, however, there are some significant variations. In the first place there is a great cry from the tomb before Jesus rolls the rock aside or instructs the occupant to come forth. This strongly suggests that the occupant was not dead and thereby, at a single stroke, contravenes any element of the miraculous. In the second place there would clearly seem to be something more involved than accepted accounts of the Lazarus episode lead one to believe. Certainly the passage quoted attests to some special relation between the man in the tomb and the man who resurrects him. A modern reader might perhaps be tempted to see a hint of homosexuality. It is possible that the Carpocratians, a sect who aspired to transcendence of the sense by means of satiation of the senses discerned precisely such a hint. But, as Professor Smith argues, it is in fact much more likely that the whole episode refers to a typical mystery school initiation a ritualized and symbolic death and rebirth of the sort so prevalent in the Middle East at the time. In any case the point is that the episode, and the passage quoted above, do not appear in any modern or accepted version of Mark. Indeed, the only references to Lazarus or a Lazarus figure in the New Testament are in the Gospel ascribed to John. It is thus clear that Clement's advice was accepted not only by Theodore, but by subsequent authorities as well. Quite simply the entire Lazarus incident was completely excised from the Gospel of Mark. If Mark's Gospel was so drastically expurgated, it was also burdened with spurious additions. In its original version it ends with the crucifixion, the burial, and the empty tomb. There is no resurrection scene, no reunion with the disciples. Granted, there are certain modern Bibles which do contain a more conventional ending to the Gospel of Mark and ending which does include the resurrection.
but virtually all modern biblical scholars concur that this expanded ending is a later addition, dating from the late 2nd century and appended to the original document. The Gospel of Mark thus provides two instances of a sacred document supposedly inspired by God which has been tampered with, edited, censored, revised by human hands. Nor are these two cases speculative. On the contrary, they are now accepted by scholars as demonstrable and proven. Can one then suppose that Mark's gospel was unique in being subjected to alteration? Clearly if Mark's gospel was so readily doctored, it is reasonable to assume that the other gospels were similarly treated. For the purposes of our investigation, then, we could not accept the gospels as definitive and unimpunable authority, but at the same time we could not discard them. They were certainly not wholly fabricated, and they furnished some of the few clues available to what really happened in the Holy Land 2,000 years ago. We therefore undertook to look more closely, to winnow through them, to disengage fact from fable, to separate the truth they contained from the spurious matrix in which that truth was often embedded. And in order to do this effectively, we were first obliged to familiarize ourselves with the historical reality and circumstances of the Holy Land at the advent of the Christian era. For the Gospels are not autonomous entities, conjured out of the void and floating, eternal and universal, over the centuries. They are historical documents, like any other like the Dead Sea Scrolls, the epics of Homer and Virgil, the Grail romances. They are products of a very specific place, a very specific time, a very specific people, and very specific historical factors. Palestine at the time of Jesus Palestine in the first century was a very troubled corner of the globe. For some time the Holy Land had been fraught with dynastic squabbles, internecine strife and, on occasion, full-scale war. During the second century BC a more or less unified Judaic kingdom was transiently established as chronicled by the two apocryphal books of Maccabees. By 63 BC however, the land was in upheaval again and ripe for conquest. More than half a century before Jesus' birth, Palestine fell to the armies of Pompey and Roman rule was imposed. But Rome at the time was overextended and too preoccupied with her own affairs to install the administrative apparatus necessary for direct rule. She therefore created a line of puppet kings to rule under her aegis. This line was that of the Herodians who were not Jewish but Arab. The first of the line was Antipater, who assumed the throne of Palestine in 63 BC. On his death in 37 BC, he was succeeded by his son, Herod the Great, who ruled until 4 BC. One must visualize, then, a situation analogous to that of France under the Vichy government between 1940 and 1944. One must visualize a conquered land and a conquered people, ruled by a puppet regime which was kept in power by military force. The people of the country were allowed to retain their own religion and customs. But the final authority was Rome. This authority was implemented according to Roman law and enforced by Roman soldiery, as it was in Britain not long after. In AD 6 the situation became more critical. In this year the country was split administratively into one province, Judea and Samaria, and two tetrarchies, Piraea and Galilee. Herod Antipas became ruler of the latter. But Judea the spiritual and secular capital was rendered subject to direct Roman rule, administered by a Roman prefect based at Caesarea. The Roman regime was brutal and autocratic. When it assumed direct control of Judea more than 3,000 rebels were summarily crucified. The temple was plundered and defiled. Heavy taxation was imposed. Torture was frequently employed, and many of the populace committed suicide. This state of affairs was not improved by Pontius Pilate, who presided as prefect of Judea from AD 26 to 36. In contrast to the biblical portraits of him, existing records indicate that Pilate was a cruel and corrupt man, who not only perpetuated, but intensified, the abuses of his predecessor. It is thus all the more surprising at least on first glance that there should be no criticism of Rome and the Gospels, no mention even of the burden of the Roman yoke. Indeed the Gospel accounts suggest that the inhabitants of Judea were placid and contented with their lot. In point of fact very few were contented, and many were far from placid. The Jews in the Holy Land at the time could be loosely divided into several sects and subsections. 
There were, for example, the Sadducees a small but wealthy land-owning class who, to the anger of their compatriots, collaborated, quizzling fashion, with the Romans. There were the Pharisees a progressive group who introduced much reform into Judaism and who, despite the portrait of them in the Gospels, placed themselves in staunch, albeit largely passive, opposition to Rome. There were the Essenes an austere, mystically oriented sect, whose teachings were much more prevalent and influential than is generally acknowledged or supposed. Among the smaller sects and sub-sects there were many whose precise character has long been lost to history and which, therefore, are difficult to define. It is worth citing the Nazarites however, of whom Samson, centuries before, had been a member, and who were still in existence during Jesus' time. And it is worth citing the Nazorians or Nazarenes a term which seems to have been applied to Jesus and his followers. Indeed the original Greek version of the New Testament refers to Jesus as Jesus of Nazarene which is mistranslated in English as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazarene, in short, is a specifically sectarian word and has no connection with Nazareth. There were numerous other groups and sects as well, one of which proved of particular relevance to our inquiry. In AD 6, when Rome assumed direct control of Judea, a Pharisee rabbi known as Judas of Galilee had created a highly militant revolutionary group composed, it would appear, of both Pharisees and Essenes. This following became known as Zealots. The Zealots were not, strictly speaking, a section. They were a movement whose membership was drawn from a number of sections. By the time of Jesus' mission, the Zealots had assumed an increasingly prominent role in the Holy Land's affairs. Their activities formed perhaps the most important political backdrop against which Jesus' drama enacted itself. Long after the crucifixion, Zealot activity continued unabated. By AD 44 this activity had so intensified that some sort of armed struggle already seemed inevitable. In AD 66 the struggle erupted, the whole of Judea rising in organized revolt against Rome. It was a desperate, tenacious, but ultimately futile conflict reminiscent in certain respects of, say, Hungary in 1956. At Caesarea alone 20,000 Jews were massacred by the Romans. Within four years Roman legions had occupied Jerusalem, razed the city, and sacked and plundered the temple. Nevertheless the mountain fortress of Masada held out for yet another three years, commanded by a lineal descendant of Judas of Galilee. The aftermath of the revolt in Judea witnessed a massive exodus of Jews from the Holy Land. Nevertheless enough remained to foment another rebellion some sixty years later in AD 132. At last, in 135, the Emperor Hadrian decreed that all Jews be expelled by law from Judea, and Jerusalem became essentially a Roman city. It was renamed Elia Capitolina. Jesus's lifetime spanned roughly the first 35 years of a turmoil extending over 140 years. The turmoil did not cease with his death, but continued for another century. And it engendered the psychological and cultural adjuncts inevitably attending any such sustained defiance of an oppressor. One of these adjuncts was the hope and longing for a Messiah who would deliver his people from the tyrant's yoke. It was only by virtue of historical and semantic accident that this term came to be applied specifically and exclusively to Jesus. For Jesus's contemporaries, no Messiah would ever have been regarded as divine. Indeed the very idea of a divine Messiah would have been preposterous if not unthinkable. The Greek word for Messiah is Christ or Christos. The term whether in Hebrew or Greek meant simply the anointed one and generally referred to a king. Thus David, when he was anointed king in the Old Testament, became, quite explicitly, a Messiah or a Christ. And every subsequent Jewish king of the house of David was known by the same appellation. Even during the Roman occupation of Judea, the Roman-appointed high priest was known as the priest Messiah or priest Christ. For the zealots, however, and for other opponents of Rome, this puppet priest was, of necessity, a false messiah. For them the true messiah implied something very different the legitimate Roy Perdue or lost king, the unknown descendant of the house of David who would deliver his people from Roman tyranny. During Jesus' lifetime anticipation of the coming of such a messiah attained a pitch verging on mass hysteria. And this anticipation continued after Jesus' death. 
Indeed the revolt of AD 66 was prompted in large part by zealot agitation and propaganda on behalf of a messiah whose advent was said to be imminent. The term messiah, then, implied nothing in any way divine. Strictly defined, it meant nothing more than an anointed king, and in the popular mind it came to mean an anointed king who would also be a liberator. In other words, it was a term with specifically political connotations, something quite different from the later Christian idea of a son of God. It was this mundane political term that was applied to Jesus. He was called Jesus the Messiah or translated into Greek Jesus the Christ. Only later was this designation contracted to Jesus Christ and a purely functional title distorted into a proper name. The History of the Gospels The Gospels issued from a recognizable and concrete historical reality. It was a reality of oppression, of civic and social discontent, of political unrest, of incessant persecution and intermittent rebellion. It was also a reality suffused with perpetual and tantalizing promises, hopes and dreams that a rightful king would appear, a spiritual and secular leader who would deliver his people into freedom. So far as political freedom was concerned, such aspirations were brutally extinguished by the devastating war between AD 66 and 74. Transposed into a wholly religious form, however, the aspirations were not only perpetuated by the Gospels, but given a powerful new impetus. Modern scholars are unanimous in concurring that the Gospels do not date from Jesus's lifetime. For the most part they date from the period between the two major revolts in Judea 66-74 and 132-135, although they are almost certainly based on earlier accounts. These earlier accounts may have included written documents, since lost for there was a wholesale destruction of records in the wake of the first rebellion. But there would certainly have been oral traditions as well. Some of these were undoubtedly grossly exaggerated and or distorted, received and transmitted at second, third or fourth hand. Others, however, may have derived from individuals who were alive in Jesus' lifetime and may even have known him personally. A young man at the time of the crucifixion might well have been alive when the Gospels were composed. The earliest of the Gospels is generally considered to be Mark's, composed sometime during the revolt of 66 to 74 or shortly thereafter except for its treatment of the resurrection, which is a later and spurious edition. Although not himself one of Jesus's original disciples, Mark seems to have come from Jerusalem. He seems to have been a companion of St. Paul, and his gospel bears an unmistakable stamp of Pauline thought. But if Mark was a native of Jerusalem, his gospel as Clement of Alexandria states was composed in Rome and addressed to a Greco-Roman audience. This, in itself, explains a great deal. At the time that Mark's gospel was composed, Judea was, or had recently been, in open revolt, and thousands of Jews were being crucified for rebellion against the Roman regime. If Mark wished his gospel to survive and impress itself on a Roman audience, he could not possibly present Jesus as anti-Roman. Indeed, he could not feasibly present Jesus as politically oriented at all. In order to ensure the survival of his message, he would have been obliged to exonerate the Romans of all guilt for Jesus' death to whitewash the existing and entrenched regime and blame the death of the Messiah on certain Jews. This device was adopted not only by the authors of the other Gospels, but by the early Christian church as well. Without such a device neither Gospels nor church would have survived. The Gospel of Luke is dated by scholars at around AD 80. Luke himself appears to have been a Greek doctor, who composed his work for a high-ranking Roman official at Caesarea, the Roman capital of Palestine. For Luke too, therefore, it would have been necessary to placate and appease the Romans and transfer the blame elsewhere. By the time the Gospel of Matthew was composed approximately AD 85 such a transference seems to have been accepted as an established fact and gone unquestioned. More than half of Matthew's Gospel, in fact, is derived directly from Mark's, although it was composed originally in Greek and reflects specifically Greek characteristics. The author seems to have been a Jew, quite possibly a refugee from Palestine. He is not to be confused with the disciple named Matthew, who would have lived much earlier and would probably have known only Aramaic. The Gospels of Mark, Luke and Matthew are known collectively as the Synoptic Gospels, implying that they see eye to eye or with one eye which, of course, they do not. 
Nevertheless, there is enough overlap between them to suggest that they derived from a single common source, either an oral tradition or some other document subsequently lost. This distinguishes them from the Gospel of John, which betrays significantly different origins. Nothing whatever is known about the author of the fourth gospel. Indeed, there is no reason to assume his name was John. Except for John the Baptist, the name John is mentioned at no point in the gospel itself, and its attribution to a man called John is generally accepted as later tradition. The fourth gospel is the latest of those in the New Testament composed around AD 100 in the vicinity of the Greek city of Ephesus. It displays a number of quite distinctive features. There is no nativity scene, for example, no description whatever of Jesus' birth, and the opening is almost Gnostic in character. The text is of a decidedly more mystical nature than the other Gospels, and the content differs as well. The other Gospels, for instance, concentrate primarily on Jesus' activities in the northern province of Galilee and reflect what appears to be only a second or third-hand knowledge of events to the south, in Judea and Jerusalem including the crucifixion. The fourth gospel, in contrast, says relatively little about Galilee. It dwells exhaustively on the events in Judea and Jerusalem which concluded Jesus' career, and its account of the crucifixion may well rest ultimately on some first-hand eyewitness testimony. It also contains a number of episodes and incidents which do not figure in the other gospels at all the wedding at Cana, the roles of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, and the raising of Lazarus, although the last was once included in Mark's gospel. On the basis of such factors modern scholars have suggested that the Gospel of John, despite its late composition, may well be the most reliable and historically accurate of the four. More than the other Gospels, it seems to draw upon traditions current among contemporaries of Jesus, as well as other material unavailable to Mark, Luke and Matthew. One modern researcher points out that it reflects an apparently first-hand topographical knowledge of Jerusalem prior to the revolt of AD 66. The same author concludes, behind the fourth gospel lies an ancient tradition independent of the other gospels. This is not an isolated opinion. In fact, it is the most prevalent in modern biblical scholarship. According to another writer, the Gospel of John, though not adhering to the Markian chronological framework and being much later in date, appears to know a tradition concerning Jesus that must be primitive and authentic. On the basis of our own research we, too, concluded that the fourth gospel was the most reliable of the books in the New Testament even though it, like the others, had been subjected to doctoring, editing, expurgation and revision. In our inquiry we had occasion to draw upon all four gospels, and much collateral material as well. But it was in the fourth gospel that we found the most persuasive evidence for our, as yet, tentative hypothesis. The Marital Status of Jesus it was not our intention to discredit the Gospels. We sought only to winnow through them to locate certain fragments of possible or probable truth and extract them from the matrix of embroidery surrounding them. We were seeking fragments, moreover, of a very precise character fragments that might attest to a marriage between Jesus and the woman known as the Magdalene. Such attestations, needless to say, would not be explicit. In order to find them, we realized, we would be obliged to read between the lines, fill in certain gaps, account for certain caesuras and ellipses. We would have to deal with omissions, with innuendos, with references that were, at best, oblique. And we would not only have to look for evidence of a marriage. We would also have to look for evidence of circumstances that might have been conducive to a marriage. Our inquiry would thus have to encompass a number of distinct, but closely related questions. We began with the most obvious of them. 1. Is there any evidence in the Gospels, direct or indirect, to suggest that Jesus was indeed married? There is, of course, no explicit statement to the effect that he was. On the other hand, there is no explicit statement to the effect that he was not and this is both more curious and more significant than it might first appear. As Dr. Geza Vermes of Oxford University points out, there is complete silence in the Gospels concerning the marital status of Jesus. Such a state of affairs is sufficiently unusual in ancient Jewry to prompt further inquiry. 10 The Gospels state that many of the disciples Peter, for example, were married. And at no point does Jesus himself advocate celibacy. On the contrary, in the Gospel of Matthew he declares, Have ye not read, 
that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? 19.4-5, such a statement can hardly be reconciled with an injunction to celibacy. And if Jesus did not preach celibacy, there is no reason either to suppose that he practiced it. According to Judaic custom at the time it was not only usual, but almost mandatory, that a man be married. Except among certain Essenes in certain communities, celibacy was vigorously condemned. During the late first century, one Jewish writer even compared deliberate celibacy with murder, and he does not seem to have been alone in this attitude. And it was as obligatory for a Jewish father to find a wife for his son as it was to ensure that his son be circumcised. If Jesus were not married, this fact would have been glaringly conspicuous. It would have drawn attention to itself and been used to characterize and identify him. It would have set him apart, in some significant sense, from his contemporaries. If this were the case, surely one at least of the gospel accounts would make some mention of so marked a deviation from custom? If Jesus were indeed as celibate as later tradition claims, it is extraordinary that there is no reference to any such celibacy. The absence of any such reference strongly suggests that Jesus, as far as the question of celibacy was concerned, conformed to the conventions of his time and culture suggests, in short, that he was married. This alone would satisfactorily explain the silence of the Gospels on the matter. The argument is summarized by a respected contemporary theological scholar, granted the cultural background is witnessed, it is highly improbable that Jesus was not married well before the beginning of his public ministry. If he had insisted upon celibacy, it would have created a stir, a reaction which would have left some trace. So, the lack of mention of Jesus' marriage in the Gospels is a strong argument not against but for the hypothesis of marriage, because any practice or advocacy of voluntary celibacy would in the Jewish context of the time have been so unusual as to have attracted much attention and comment. The hypothesis of marriage becomes all the more tenable by virtue of the title of rabbi, which is frequently applied to Jesus in the Gospels. It is possible, of course, that this term is employed in its very broadest sense, meaning simply a self-appointed teacher. But Jesus's literacy his display of knowledge to the elders in the temple, for example strongly suggests that he was more than a self-appointed teacher. It suggests that he underwent some species of formal rabbinical training and was officially recognized as a rabbi. This would conform to tradition, which depicts Jesus as a rabbi in the strict sense of the word. But if Jesus was a rabbi in the strict sense of the word, a marriage would not only have been likely, but virtually certain. The Jewish Mishnaic law is quite explicit on the subject, an unmarried man may not be a teacher. In the fourth gospel there is an episode related to a marriage which may, in fact, have been Jesus' own. This episode is, of course, the wedding at Cana a familiar enough story. But for all its familiarity, there are certain salient questions attending it which warrant consideration. From the account in the fourth gospel, the wedding at Cana would seem to be a modest local ceremony a typical village wedding, whose bride and groom remain anonymous. To this wedding Jesus is specifically called which is slightly curious perhaps, for he has not yet really embarked on his ministry. More curious still however, is the fact that his mother just happens, as it were, to be present. And her presence would seem to be taken for granted. It is certainly not in any way explained. What is more, it is Mary who not merely suggests to her son, but in effect orders him to replenish the wine. She behaves quite as if she were the hostess, and when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. John 2 verses 3 to 4, But Mary, thoroughly unperturbed, ignores her son's protest, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. 5. And the servants promptly comply quite as if they were accustomed to receiving orders from both Mary and Jesus. Despite Jesus's ostensible attempt to disown her, Mary prevails, and Jesus thereupon performs his first major miracle, the transmutation of water into wine. So far as the Gospels are concerned, he has not hitherto displayed his powers, and there is no reason for Mary to assume he even possesses them. But even if there were, why should such unique and holy gifts be employed for so banal a purpose? 
Why should Mary make such a request of her son? More important still, why should two guests at a wedding take on themselves the responsibility of catering a responsibility that, by custom, should be reserved for the host? Unless, of course, the wedding at Cana is Jesus' own wedding. In that case, it would indeed be his responsibility to replenish the wine. There is further evidence that the wedding at Cana is in fact Jesus' own. Immediately after the miracle has been performed, the governor of the feast a kind of majordomo or master of ceremonies tastes the newly produced wine, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. John 2 verses 9 to 10, are italics. These words would clearly seem to be addressed to Jesus. According to the gospel, however, they are addressed to the bridegroom. An obvious conclusion is that Jesus and the bridegroom are one and the same. The wife of Jesus. 2. If Jesus was married, is there any indication in the gospels of the identity of his wife? On first consideration there would appear to be two possible candidates two women, apart from his mother, who are mentioned repeatedly in the Gospels as being of his entourage. The first of these is the Magdalene or, more precisely, Mary from the village of the Migdal, or Magdala, in Galilee. In all four Gospels this woman's role is singularly ambiguous and seems to have been deliberately obscured. In the accounts of Mark and Matthew she is not mentioned by name until quite late. When she does appear it is in Judea, at the time of the crucifixion, and she is numbered among Jesus' followers. In the Gospel of Luke, however, she appears relatively early in Jesus' ministry, while he is still preaching from Galilee. It would thus seem that she accompanies him from Galilee to Judea or, if not, that she at least moves between the two provinces as readily as he does. This in itself strongly suggests that she was married to someone. In the Palestine of Jesus' time it would have been unthinkable for an unmarried woman to travel unaccompanied and, even more so, to travel unaccompanied with a religious teacher and his entourage. A number of traditions seem to have taken cognizance of this potentially embarrassing fact. Thus it is sometimes claimed that the Magdalene was married to one of Jesus' disciples. If that were the case however, her special relationship with Jesus and her proximity to him would have rendered both of them subject to suspicions, if not charges, of adultery. Popular tradition notwithstanding, the Magdalene is not, at any point in any of the Gospels, said to be a prostitute. When she is first mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, she is described as a woman out of whom went seven devils. It is generally assumed that this phrase refers to a species of exorcism on Jesus' part, implying that the Magdalene was possessed. But the phrase may equally refer to some sort of conversion and or ritual initiation. The cult of Ishtar or Astarte the mother goddess and queen of heaven involved, for example, a seven-stage initiation. Prior to her affiliation with Jesus, the Magdalene may well have been associated with such a cult. One chapter before he speaks of the Magdalene, Luke alludes to a woman who anointed Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark there is a similar anointment by an unnamed woman. Neither Luke nor Mark explicitly identify this woman with the Magdalene. But Luke reports that she was a fallen woman a sinner. Subsequent commentators have assumed that the Magdalene, since she apparently had seven devils cast out of her, must have been a sinner. On this basis the woman who anoints Jesus and the Magdalene came to be regarded as the same person. In fact they may well have been. If the Magdalene were associated with a pagan cult, that would certainly have rendered her a sinner in the eyes not only of Luke, but of later writers as well. If the Magdalene was a sinner, she was also, quite clearly, something more than the common prostitute of popular tradition. Quite clearly she was a woman of means. Luke reports, for example, that her friends included the wife of a high dignitary at Herod's court and that both women, together with various others, supported Jesus and his disciples with their financial resources. The woman who anointed Jesus was also a woman of means. In Mark's gospel great stress is laid upon the costliness of the spikenard ointment with which the ritual was performed. The whole episode of Jesus' anointing would seem to be an affair of considerable consequence. Why else would it be emphasized by the Gospels to the extent it is? Given its prominence, it appears to be something more than an impulsive spontaneous gesture.
It appears to be a carefully premeditated rite. One must remember that anointing was the traditional prerogative of kings and of the rightful Messiah, which means the anointed one. From this, it follows that Jesus becomes an authentic Messiah by virtue of his anointing. And the woman who consecrates him in that august role can hardly be unimportant. In any case it is clear that the Magdalene, by the end of Jesus's ministry, has become a figure of immense significance. In the three synoptic gospels her name consistently heads the lists of women who followed Jesus, just as Simon Peter heads the lists of male disciples. And, of course, she was the first witness to the empty tomb following the crucifixion. Among all his devotees, it was to the Magdalene that Jesus first chose to reveal his resurrection. Throughout the gospels Jesus treats the Magdalene in a unique and preferential manner. Such treatment may well have induced jealousy in other disciples. It would seem fairly obvious that later tradition endeavored to blacken the Magdalene's background, if not her name. The portrayal of her as a harlot may well have been the overcompensation of a vindictive following, intent on impugning the reputation of a woman whose association with Jesus was closer than their own and thus inspired an all-too-human envy. If other Christians, either during Jesus's lifetime or afterwards, grudged the Magdalene her unique bond with their spiritual leader, there might well have been an attempt to diminish her in the eyes of posterity. There is no question that she was so diminished. Even today one thinks of her as a harlot, and during the Middle Ages houses for reformed prostitutes were called Magdalenes. But the Gospels themselves bear witness that the woman who imparted her name to these institutions did not deserve to be so stigmatized. Whatever the status of the Magdalene in the Gospels, she is not the only possible candidate for Jesus' wife. There is one other, who figures most prominently in the fourth gospel, and who may be identified as Mary of Bethany, sister of Martha and Lazarus. She and her family are clearly on very familiar terms with Jesus. They are also wealthy, maintaining a house in a fashionable suburb of Jerusalem large enough to accommodate Jesus and his entire entourage. What is more, the Lazarus episode reveals that this house contains a private tomb a somewhat flamboyant luxury in Jesus' time, not only a sign of wealth, but also a status symbol attesting to aristocratic connections. In biblical Jerusalem, as in any modern city, land was at a premium, and only a very few could afford the self-indulgence of a private burial site. When, in the fourth gospel, Lazarus falls ill, Jesus has left Bethany for a few days and is staying with his disciples on the Jordan. Hearing of what has happened, he nevertheless delays for two days a rather curious reaction, and then returns to Bethany, where Lazarus lies in the tomb. As he approaches, Martha rushes forth to meet him and cries, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. John 11 verse 21, it is a perplexing assertion, for why should Jesus's physical presence necessarily have prevented the man's death? But the incident is significant because Martha, when she greets Jesus, is alone. One would expect Mary, her sister, to be with her. Mary, however, is sitting in the house and does not emerge until Jesus explicitly commands her to do so. The point becomes clearer in the secret gospel of Mark, discovered by Professor Morton Smith and cited earlier in this chapter. In the suppressed account by Mark, it would appear that Mary does emerge from the house before Jesus instructs her to do so. And she is promptly and angrily rebuked by the disciples, whom Jesus is obliged to silence. It would be plausible enough for Mary to be sitting in the house when Jesus arrives in Bethany. In accordance with Jewish custom, she would be sitting Shiva sitting in mourning. But why does she not join Martha and rush to meet Jesus on his return? There is one obvious explanation. By the tenets of Judaic law at the time, a woman sitting Shiva would have been strictly forbidden to emerge from the house except at the express bidding of her husband. In this incident the behavior of Jesus and Mary of Bethany conforms precisely to the traditional comportment of a Jewish man and wife. There is additional evidence for a possible marriage between Jesus and Mary of Bethany. It occurs more or less as a non sequitur in the Gospel of Luke, now it came to pass, as they went, that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet, and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? 
Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Luke 10 verses 38-42 From Martha's appeal, it would seem apparent that Jesus exercises some sort of authority over Mary. More important still, however, is Jesus' reply. In any other context one would not hesitate to interpret this reply as an allusion to a marriage. In any case it clearly suggests that Mary of Bethany was as avid a disciple as the Magdalene. There is substantial reason for regarding the Magdalene and the woman who anoints Jesus as one and the same person. Could this person, we wondered, also be one and the same with Mary of Bethany, sister of Lazarus and Martha? Could these women who, in the Gospels, appear in three different contexts in fact be a single person? The medieval church certainly regarded them as such, and so did popular tradition. Many biblical scholars today concur. There is abundant evidence to support such a conclusion. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark and John, for example, all cite the Magdalene as being present at the crucifixion. None of them cites Mary of Bethany. But if Mary of Bethany was as devoted a disciple as she appears to be, her absence would seem to be, at the least, remiss. Is it credible that she not to mention her brother, Lazarus would fail to witness the climactic moment of Jesus' life? Such an omission would be both inexplicable and reprehensible unless, of course, she was present and cited by the Gospels as such under the name of the Magdalene. If the Magdalene and Mary of Bethany are one and the same, there is no question of the latter having been absent from the crucifixion. The Magdalene can be identified with Mary of Bethany. The Magdalene can also be identified with the woman who anoints Jesus. The fourth gospel identifies the woman who anoints Jesus with Mary of Bethany. Indeed, the author of the fourth gospel is quite explicit on the matter, now a certain man was sick, named Lazarus, of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. John 11 verses 1 to 2, and again, one chapter later, then Jesus six days before the Passover came to Bethany, where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. John 12 verses 1 to 3, it is thus clear that Mary of Bethany and the woman who anoints Jesus are the same woman. If not equally clear, it is certainly probable that this woman is also the Magdalene. If Jesus was indeed married, there would thus seem to be only one candidate for his wife one woman who recurs repeatedly in the Gospels under different names and in different roles. The Beloved Disciple 3. If the Magdalene and Mary of Bethany are the same woman, and if this woman was Jesus' wife, Lazarus would have been Jesus's brother-in-law. Is there any evidence in the Gospels to suggest that Lazarus did indeed enjoy such a status? Lazarus does not figure by name in the Gospels of Luke, Matthew and Mark although his resurrection from the dead was originally contained in Mark's account and then excised. As a result Lazarus is known to posterity only through the fourth Gospel the Gospel of John. But here it is clear that he does enjoy some species of preferential treatment which is not confined to being raised from the dead. In this and a number of other respects, he would appear, if anything, to be closer to Jesus than the disciples themselves. And yet, curiously enough, the Gospels do not even number him among the disciples. Unlike the disciples, Lazarus is actually menaced. According to the fourth Gospel, the chief priests, on resolving to dispatch Jesus, decided to kill Lazarus as well, John 12 verse 10. Lazarus would seem to have been active in some way on Jesus' behalf, which is more than can be said of some of the disciples. In theory this should have qualified him to be a disciple himself, and yet he is still not cited as such. Nor is he said to have been present at the crucifixion, an apparently shameless display of ingratitude in a man who, quite literally, owed Jesus his life. Granted, he might have gone into hiding, given the threat directed against him. But it is extremely curious that there is no further reference to him in the Gospels. He seems to have vanished completely and is never mentioned again. Or is he? 
we attempted to examine the matter more closely. After staying in Bethany for three months, Jesus retires with his disciples to the banks of the Jordan, not much more than a day's distance away. Here a messenger hastens to him with the news that Lazarus is ill. But the messenger does not refer to Lazarus by name. On the contrary, he portrays the sick man as someone of very special importance, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. John 11 verse 3, Jesus' reaction to this news is distinctly odd. Instead of returning post-haste to the succor of the man he supposedly loves, he blithely dismisses the matter. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. 11 colon 4, and if his words are perplexing, his actions are even more so, when he heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the same place where he was. 11 colon 6, in short Jesus continues to dally at the Jordan for another two days despite the alarming news he has received. At last he resolves to return to Bethany. And then he flagrantly contradicts his previous statement by telling the disciples that Lazarus is dead. He is still unperturbed however. Indeed, he states plainly that Lazarus's death had served some purpose, and is to be turned to account, our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go, that I may awake him out of sleep. 11.11 11, and four verses later he virtually admits that the whole affair has been carefully stage-managed and arranged in advance, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there, to the intent ye may believe, nevertheless, let us go unto him. 11.15, if such behavior is bewildering, the reaction of the disciples is no less so, then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, let us also go, that we may die with him. 11.16, what does this mean? If Lazarus is literally dead, surely the disciples have no intention of joining him by a collective suicide. And how is one to account for Jesus' own carelessness the blasé indifference with which he hears of Lazarus's illness and his delay in returning to Bethany? The explanations of the matter would seem to lie, as Professor Morton Smith suggests, in a more or less standard mystery school initiation. As Professor Smith demonstrates, such initiations and their accompanying rituals were common enough in the Palestine of Jesus' era. They often entailed a symbolic death and rebirth, which were called by those names, sequestration in a tomb, which became a womb for the acolytes' rebirth, a rite, which is now called baptism a symbolic immersion in water, and a cup of wine, which was identified with the blood of the prophet or magician presiding over the ceremony. By drinking from such a cup, the disciple consummated a symbolic union with his teacher, the former becoming mystically one with the latter. Significantly enough, it is precisely in these terms that St. Paul explains the purpose of baptism. And Jesus himself uses the same terms at the Last Supper. As Professor Smith points out, Jesus's career is very similar to those of other magicians, healers, wonder workers, and miracle workers of the period. Throughout the four Gospels, for example, he consistently meets secretly with the people he is about to heal, or speaks quietly with them alone. Afterwards he often asks them not to divulge what transpired. And so far as the general public is concerned, he speaks habitually in allegories and parables. It would seem, then, that Lazarus, during Jesus's sojourn at the Jordan, has embarked on a typical initiation rite, leading as such rites traditionally did to a symbolic resurrection and rebirth. In this light the disciples' desire to die with him becomes perfectly comprehensible, as does Jesus's otherwise inexplicable complacency about the whole affair. Granted, Mary and Martha would appear to be genuinely distraught as would a number of other people but they may simply have misunderstood or misconstrued the point of the exercise. Or perhaps something seemed to have gone wrong with the initiation and not uncommon occurrence. Or perhaps the whole affair was a skillfully contrived piece of stagecraft, whose true nature and purpose were known only to a very few. If the Lazarus incident does reflect a ritual initiation, he is clearly receiving very preferential treatment. Among other things, he is apparently being initiated before any of the disciples who, indeed, seem decidedly envious of his privilege. But why should this hitherto unknown man of Bethany thus be singled out? Why should he undergo an experience in which the disciples are so eager to join him? Why should later, mystically oriented heretics like the Carpocratians have made so? Much of the matter? 
And why should the entire episode have been expurgated from the Gospel of Mark? Perhaps because Lazarus was he whom Jesus loved more than the other disciples. Perhaps because Lazarus had some special connection with Jesus like that of brother-in-law. Perhaps both. It is possible that Jesus came to know and love Lazarus precisely because Lazarus was his brother-in-law. In any case the love is repeatedly stressed. When Jesus returns to Bethany and weeps, or feigns to weep, for Lazarus's death, the bystanders echo the words of the messenger, Behold how he loved him. John 11 verse 36, the author of the Gospel of John The Gospel in which the Lazarus story figures does not at any point identify himself as John. In fact, he does not name himself at all. He does, however, refer to himself by a most distinctive appellation. He constantly calls himself the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and clearly implies that he enjoys a unique and preferred status over his comrades. At the Last Supper, for example, he flagrantly displays his personal proximity to Jesus, and it is to him alone that Jesus confides the means whereby betrayal will occur. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him, that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then lying on Jesus' breast saith unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is, to whom I shall give a sop, when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. John 13 verses 23-6, Who is this beloved disciple? on whose testimony the fourth gospel is based. All the evidence suggests that he is in fact Lazarus he whom Jesus loved. It would seem, then, that Lazarus and the beloved disciple are one and the same person, and that Lazarus is the real identity of John. This conclusion would seem to be almost inevitable. Nor were we alone in reaching it. According to Professor William Brownlee, a leading biblical scholar and one of the foremost experts on the Dead Sea Scrolls, from internal evidence in the fourth gospel, the conclusion is that the beloved disciple is Lazarus of Bethany. 14 If Lazarus and the beloved disciple are one and the same, it would explain a number of anomalies. It would explain Lazarus's mysterious disappearance from the scriptural account and his apparent absence during the crucifixion. For if Lazarus and the beloved disciple were one and the same, Lazarus would have been present at the crucifixion. And it would have been to Lazarus that Jesus entrusted the care of his mother. The words with which he did so might well be the words of a man referring to his brother-in-law, when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciple standing by, whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour the disciple took her unto his own home. John 19 verses 26 to 7, the last word of this quotation is particularly revelatory. For the other disciples have left their homes in Galilee and, to all intents and purposes, are homeless. Lazarus, however, does have a home that crucial house in Bethany, where Jesus himself was accustomed to stay. After the priests are said to have decided on his death, Lazarus is not again mentioned by name. He would appear to vanish completely. But if he is indeed the beloved disciple, he does not vanish at all, and his movements and activities can be traced to the very end of the fourth gospel. And here too, there is a curious episode that warrants examination. At the end of the fourth gospel Jesus forecasts Peter's death and instructs Peter to follow him, then Peter, turning about, seat the disciple whom Jesus loved following, which also leaned on his breast at supper and said, Lord, which is he that betrayeth thee? Peter seeing him saith to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus saith unto him, If I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? Follow thou me. Then went this saying abroad among the brethren, that that disciple should not die, yet Jesus said not unto him, He shall not die, but, if I will that he tarry till I come, what is that to thee? This is the disciple which testifieth of these things, and wrote. These things, and we know that his testimony is true. John 21 verses 20 to 24, despite its ambiguous phraseology, the import of this passage would seem to be clear. The beloved disciple has been explicitly instructed to wait for Jesus' return. And the text itself is quite emphatic in stressing that this return is not to be understood symbolically in the sense of a second coming. On the contrary, it implies something much more mundane. 
It implies that Jesus, after dispatching his other followers out into the world, must soon return with some special commission for the beloved disciple. It is almost as if they have specific, concrete arrangements to conclude and plans to make. If the beloved disciple is Lazarus, such collusion, unknown to the other disciples, would seem to have a certain precedent. In the week before the crucifixion, Jesus undertakes to make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem, and in order to do so in accordance with Old Testament prophecies of a Messiah, he must be riding astride an ass. Zechariah 9 verses 9 to 10, accordingly an ass must be procured. In Luke's gospel Jesus dispatches two disciples to Bethany, where, he tells them, they will find an ass awaiting them. They are instructed to tell the beast's owner that the master has need of it. When everything transpires precisely as Jesus has forecast, it is regarded as a sort of miracle. But is there really anything very extraordinary about it? Does it not merely attest to carefully laid plans? And would not the man from Bethany who provides an ass at the appointed time seem to be Lazarus? This, certainly, is the conclusion of Dr. Hugh Sconfield. He argues convincingly that the arrangements for Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem were entrusted to Lazarus, and that the other disciples had no knowledge of them. If this was indeed the case, it attests to an inner circle of Jesus' followers, a core of collaborators, co-conspirators or family members who, alone, are admitted into their master's confidence. Dr. Sconfield believes that Lazarus is part of just such a circle. And his belief concurs with Professor Smith's insistence on the preferential treatment Lazarus receives by virtue of his initiation, or symbolic death, at Bethany. It is possible that Bethany was a cult center, a place reserved for the unique rituals over which Jesus presided. If so, this might explain the otherwise enigmatic occurrence of Bethany elsewhere in our investigation. The Prier de Chaun had called its arch at Rennes le Chateau Bethany. And Saunier, apparently at the Prier de Chaun's request, had christened his villa Villa Bethania. In any case, the collusion which seems to elicit an ass from the man from Bethany may well be displaying itself again at the mysterious end of the fourth gospel when Jesus orders the beloved disciple to tarry until he returns. It would seem that he and the beloved disciple have plans to make. And it is not unreasonable to assume that these plans included the care of Jesus's family. At the crucifixion he had already entrusted his mother to the beloved disciple's custody. If he had a wife and children they, presumably, would have been entrusted to the beloved disciple as well. This, of course, would be all the more plausible if the beloved disciple were indeed his brother-in-law. According to much later tradition, Jesus's mother eventually died in exile at Ephesus from whence the fourth gospel is said to have subsequently issued. There is no indication, however, that the beloved disciple attended Jesus's mother for the duration of her life. According to Dr. Sconfield, the fourth gospel was probably not composed at Ephesus, only reworked, revised and edited by a Greek elder there who made it conform to his own ideas. If the beloved disciple did not go to Ephesus, what became of him? If he and Lazarus were one and the same that question can be answered, for tradition is quite explicit about what became of Lazarus. According to tradition, as well as certain early church writers, Lazarus, the Magdalene, Martha, Joseph of Arimathea, and a few others, were transported by ship to Marseilles. Here Joseph was supposedly consecrated by Saint Philip and sent on to England, where he established a church at Glastonbury. Lazarus and the Magdalene, however, are said to have remained in Gaul. Tradition maintains that the Magdalene died at either aix in Provence or Saint Baume, and Lazarus at Marseilles after founding the first bishopric there. One of their companions, St. Maximin, is said to have founded the first bishopric of Narbonne. If Lazarus and the beloved disciple were one and the same, there would thus be an explanation for their joint disappearance. Lazarus, the true beloved disciple, would seem to have been set ashore at Marseilles, together with his sister who, as tradition subsequently maintains, was carrying with her the Holy Grail, the Blood Royal. And the arrangements for this escape and exile would seem to have been made by Jesus himself, together with the beloved disciple, at the end of the fourth gospel. The dynasty of Jesus for, if Jesus was indeed married to the Magdalene, might such a marriage have served some specific purpose? In other words, might it have been something more than a conventional marriage? Might it have been a dynastic?
alliance of some kind with political implications and repercussions? Might a bloodline resulting from such a marriage, in short, have fully warranted the appellation blood royal? The Gospel of Matthew states explicitly that Jesus was of royal blood a genuine king, the lineal descendant of Solomon and David. If this is true, he would have enjoyed a legitimate claim to the throne of a united Palestine, and perhaps even the legitimate claim. And the inscription affixed to the cross would have been much more than mere sadistic derision, for Jesus would indeed have been king of the Jews. His position, in many respects, would have been analogous to that of, say, Bonnie Prince Charlie in 1745. And thus he would have engendered the opposition, he did precisely by virtue of his role the role of a priest king who might possibly unify his country and the Jewish people, thereby posing a serious threat to both Herod and Rome. Certain modern biblical scholars have argued that Herod's famous massacre of the innocents never in fact took place. Even if it did, it was probably not of the garish and appalling proportions ascribed to it by the Gospels and subsequent tradition. And yet the very perpetuation of the story would seem to attest to something some genuine alarm on Herod's part, some very real anxiety about being deposed. Granted, Herod was an extremely insecure ruler, hated by his enslaved subjects and sustained in power only by Roman cohorts. But however precarious his position might have been, it cannot, realistically speaking, have been seriously threatened by rumors of a mystical or spiritual savior of the kind with which the Holy Land at the time already abounded anyway. If Herod was indeed worried, it can only have been by a very real, concrete, political threat the threat posed by a man who possessed a more legitimate claim to the throne than his own, and who could muster substantial popular support. The massacre of the innocents may never have occurred, but the traditions relating to it reflect some concern on Herod's part about a rival claim and, quite possibly, some action intended to forestall or preclude it. Such a claim can only have been political in nature. And it must have warranted being taken seriously. To suggest that Jesus enjoyed such a claim is, of course, to challenge the popular image of the poor carpenter from Nazareth. But there are persuasive reasons for doing so. In the first place it is not altogether certain that Jesus was from Nazareth. Jesus of Nazareth is in fact a corruption or mistranslation of Jesus the Nazarite or Jesus the Nazorian or perhaps Jesus of Genesareth. In the second place there is considerable doubt as to whether the town of Nazareth actually existed in Jesus' time. It does not occur in any Roman maps, documents, or records. It is not mentioned in the Talmud. It is not mentioned, still less associated with Jesus, in any of the writings of St. Paul which were, after all, composed before the Gospels. And Flavius Josephus the foremost chronicler of the period, who commanded troops in Galilee and listed the province's towns makes no mention of Nazareth either. It would seem, in short, that Nazareth did not appear as a town until sometime after the revolt of AD 68-74, and that Jesus' name became associated with it by virtue of the semantic confusion accidental or deliberate which characterizes so much of the New Testament. Whether Jesus was of Nazareth or not there is no indication that he was ever a poor carpenter. Certainly none of the Gospels portrays him as such. Indeed their evidence suggests quite the contrary. He seems to be well-educated, for example. He seems to have undergone training for the rabbinate, and to have consorted as frequently with wealthy and influential people as with the poor Joseph of Arimathea, for instance, and Nicodemus. And the wedding at Cana would seem to bear further witness to Jesus's status and social position. This wedding does not appear to have been a modest, humble festival conducted by the common people. On the contrary it bears all the marks of an extravagant aristocratic union, a high society affair, attended by at least several hundred guests. There are abundant servants, for example, who hasten to do both Mary's and Jesus's bidding. There is a master of the feast or master of ceremonies who, in the context, would have been a kind of chief butler or perhaps even an aristocrat himself. Most clearly there is a positively enormous quantity of wine. When Jesus transmutes the water into wine, he produces, according to the Good News Bible, no less than 600 liters, which is more than 800 bottles. And this is in addition to what has already been consumed. All things considered, the wedding at Cana would seem to have been a sumptuous ceremony of the gentry or aristocracy. Even if the wedding were not Jesus' own, his presence at it, 
and his mother's would suggest that they were members of the same caste. This alone would explain the servant's obedience to them. If Jesus was an aristocrat, and if he was married to the Magdalene, it is probable that she was of comparable social station. And indeed, she would appear to be so. As we have seen she numbered among her friends the wife of an important official at Herod's court. But she may have been more important still. As we had discovered by tracing references in the prior documents, Jerusalem the holy city and capital of Judea had originally been the property of the tribe of Benjamin. Subsequently the Benjamites were decimated in their war with the other tribes of Israel, and many of them went into exile although, as the prior documents maintain, certain of them remained. One descendant of this remnant was St. Paul, who states explicitly that he is a Benjamite. Romans 11 verse 1, despite their conflict with the other tribes of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin appears to have enjoyed some special status. Among other things, it provided Israel with her first king Saul, anointed by the prophet Samuel, and with her first royal house. But Saul was eventually deposed by David, of the tribe of Judah. And David not only deprived the Benjamites of their claim to the throne, by establishing his capital at Jerusalem he deprived them of their rightful inheritance as well. According to all New Testament accounts, Jesus was of the line of David, and thus also a member of the tribe of Judah. In Benjamite eyes this might have rendered him, at least in some sense, a usurper. Any such objection might have been surmounted however, if he were married to a Benjamite woman. Such a marriage would have constituted an important dynastic alliance, and one filled with political consequence. It would not only have provided Israel with a powerful priest king. It would also have performed the symbolic function of returning Jerusalem to its original and rightful owners. Thus it would have served to encourage popular unity and support, and consolidated whatever claim to the throne Jesus might have possessed. In the New Testament there is no indication of the Magdalene's tribal affiliation. In subsequent legends however, she is said to have been of royal lineage. And there are other traditions which state specifically that she was of the tribe of Benjamin. At this point, the outlines of a coherent historical scenario began to be discernible. And, as far as we could see, it made sound political sense. Jesus would have been a priest king of the line of David, who possessed a legitimate claim to the throne. He would have consolidated his position by a symbolically important dynastic marriage. He would then have been poised to unify his country, mobilize the populace behind him, drive out the oppressors, depose their abject puppet, and restore the glory of the monarchy as it was under Solomon. Such a man would indeed have been king of the Jews. The Crucifixion 5. As Gandhi's accomplishments bear witness, a spiritual leader, given sufficient popular support, can pose a threat to an existing regime. But a married man, with a rightful claim to the throne and children through whom to establish a dynasty, is a threat of a decidedly more serious nature. Is there any evidence in the Gospels that Jesus was in fact regarded by the Romans as such a threat? During his interview with Pilate, Jesus is repeatedly called King of the Jews. In accordance with Pilate's instructions, an inscription of this title is also affixed to the cross. As Professor S. G. F. Brandon of Manchester University argues, the inscription affixed to the cross must be regarded as genuine as much so as anything in the New Testament. In the first place it figures, with virtually no variation, in all four Gospels. In the second place it is too compromising, too embarrassing an episode for subsequent editors to have invented it. In the Gospel of Mark, Pilate, after interrogating Jesus, asks the assembled dignitaries, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the King of the Jews? Mark 15 verse 12, this would seem to indicate that at least some Jews do actually refer to Jesus as their King. At the same time, however, in all four Gospels Pilate also accords Jesus that title. There is no reason to suppose that he does so ironically or derisively. In the fourth gospel he insists on it quite adamantly and seriously, despite a chorus of protests. In the three synoptic gospels, moreover, Jesus himself acknowledged his claim to the title, and Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. Mark 15 verse 2, in the English translation this reply may sound ambivalent perhaps deliberately so. In the original Greek however, its import is quite unequivocal. 
it can only be interpreted as thou hast spoken correctly. And thus the phrase is interpreted whenever it appears elsewhere in the Bible. The Gospels were composed during and after the revolt of AD 68-74, when Judaism had effectively ceased to exist as an organized social, political, and military force. What is more, the Gospels were composed for a Greco-Roman audience for whom they had, of necessity, to be made acceptable. Rome had just fought a bitter and costly war against the Jews. In consequence it was perfectly natural to cast the Jews in the role of villains. In the wake of the Judean revolt, moreover, Jesus could not possibly be portrayed as a political figure a figure in any way linked to the agitation which culminated in the war. Finally the role of the Romans in Jesus's trial and execution had to be whitewashed and presented as sympathetically as possible. Thus Pilate is depicted in the Gospels as a decent, responsible and tolerant man, who consents only reluctantly to the crucifixion. But despite these liberties taken with history, Rome's true position in the affair can be discerned. According to the Gospels, Jesus is initially condemned by the Sanhedrin the council of Jewish elders who then bring him to Pilate and beseech the procurator to pronounce against him. Historically this makes no sense at all. In the three synoptic Gospels Jesus is arrested and condemned by the Sanhedrin on the night of the Passover. But by Judaic law the Sanhedrin was forbidden to meet over the Passover. In the Gospels Jesus's arrest and trial occur at night, before the Sanhedrin. By Judaic law the Sanhedrin was forbidden to meet at night, in private houses, or anywhere outside the precincts of the temple. In the Gospels the Sanhedrin is apparently unauthorized to pass a death sentence, and this would ostensibly be the reason for bringing Jesus to Pilate. However, the Sanhedrin was authorized to pass death sentences by stoning, if not by crucifixion. If the Sanhedrin had wished to dispose of Jesus, therefore, it could have sentenced him to death by stoning on its own authority. There would have been no need to bother Pilate at all. There are numerous other attempts by the authors of the Gospels to transfer guilt and responsibility from Rome. One such is Pilate's apparent offer of a dispensation is readiness to free a prisoner of the crowd's choosing. According to the Gospels of Mark and Matthew, this was a custom of the Passover festival. In fact it was no such thing. Modern authorities agree that no such policy ever existed on the part of the Romans, and that the offer to liberate either Jesus or Barabbas is sure fiction. Pilate's reluctance to condemn Jesus and his grudging submission to the bullying pressure of the mob would seem to be equally fictitious. In reality it would have been unthinkable for a Roman procurator, and especially a procurator as ruthless as Pilate to bow to the pressure of a mob. Again, the purpose of such fictionalization is clear enough to exonerate the Romans, to transfer blame to the Jews and thereby to make Jesus acceptable to a Roman audience. It is possible, of course, that not all Jews were entirely innocent. Even if the Roman administration feared a priest-king with a claim to the throne, it could not embark overtly on acts of provocation acts that might precipitate a full-scale rebellion. Certainly, it would have been more expedient for Rome if the priest-king were ostensibly betrayed by his own people. It is thus conceivable that the Romans employed certain Sadducees as, say, agents provocateurs. But even if this were the case, the inescapable fact remains that Jesus was the victim of a Roman administration, a Roman court, a Roman sentence, Roman soldiery, and a Roman execution an execution which, in form, was reserved exclusively for enemies of Rome. It was not for crimes against Judaism that Jesus was crucified, but for crimes against the empire. Who was Barabbas? 6. Is there any evidence in the Gospels that Jesus actually did have children? There is nothing explicit. But rabbis were expected, as a matter of course, to have children, and if Jesus was a rabbi, it would have been most unusual for him to remain childless. Indeed, it would have been unusual for him to remain childless whether he was a rabbi or not. Granted, these arguments, in themselves, do not constitute any positive evidence. But there is evidence of a more concrete, more specific kind. It consists of the elusive individual who figures in the Gospels as Barabbas or, to be more precise, as Jesus Barabbas for it is by this name that he is identified in the Gospel of Matthew. If nothing else, the coincidence is striking. Modern scholars are uncertain about the derivation and meaning of Barabbas. 
Jesus Barabbas may be a corruption of Jesus Barabbai. Barabbai was a title reserved for the highest and most esteemed rabbis and was placed after the rabbi's given name. Jesus Barabbai might therefore refer to Jesus himself. Alternatively, Jesus Barabbas might originally have been Jesus bar Rabbi Jesus, son of the rabbi. There is no record anywhere of Jesus's own father having been a rabbi. But if Jesus had a son named after himself, that son would indeed have been Jesus bar Rabbi. There is one other possibility as well. Jesus Barabbas may derive from Jesus bar Abba, and since Abba is father in Hebrew, Barabbas would then mean son of the father a fairly pointless designation, unless the father is in some way special. If the father were actually the heavenly father, then Barabbas might again refer, refer to Jesus himself. On the other hand, if Jesus himself is the father, Barabbas would again refer to his son. Whatever the meaning and derivation of the name, the figure of Barabbas is extremely curious. And the more one considers the incident concerning him, the more apparent it becomes that something irregular is going on and someone is attempting to conceal something. In the first place Barabbas's name, like the Magdalene's, seems to have been subjected to a deliberate and systematic blackening. Just as popular tradition depicts the Magdalene as a harlot, so it depicts Barabbas as a thief. But if Barabbas was any of the things his name suggests, he is hardly likely to have been a common thief. Why then blacken his name? Unless he was something else in reality something which the editors of the New Testament did not want posterity to know. Strictly speaking the Gospels themselves do not describe Barabbas as a thief. According to Mark and Luke he is a political prisoner, a rebel charged with murder and insurrection. In the Gospel of Matthew however, Barabbas is described as a notable prisoner. And in the fourth Gospel Barabbas is said to be, in the Greek, a lestai. John 18 verse 40, this can be translated as either robber or bandit. In its historical context however, it meant something quite different. Lests was in fact the term habitually applied by the Romans to the zealots the militant nationalist revolutionaries who for some time had been fomenting social upheaval. Since Mark and Luke agree that Barabbas is guilty of insurrection, and since Matthew does not contradict this assertion, it is safe to conclude that Barabbas was a zealot. But this is not the only information available on Barabbas. According to Luke, he had been involved in a recent disturbance, sedition, or riot in the city. History makes no mention of any such turmoil in Jerusalem at the time. The Gospels, however, do. According to the Gospels, there had been a civic disturbance in Jerusalem, only a few days before when Jesus and his followers overturned the tables of the money lenders at the temple. Was this the disturbance in which Barabbas was involved and for which he was imprisoned? It certainly seems likely. And in that case there is one obvious conclusion that Barabbas was one of Jesus's entourage. According to modern scholars, the custom of releasing a prisoner on the Passover did not exist. But even if it did, the choice of Barabbas over Jesus would make no sense. If Barabbas were indeed a common criminal, guilty of murder, why would the people choose to have his life spared? And if he were indeed a zealot or a revolutionary, it is hardly likely that Pilate would have released so potentially dangerous a character, rather than a harmless visionary who was quite prepared, ostensibly, to render unto Caesar. Of all the discrepancies, inconsistencies and improbabilities in the Gospels, the choice of Barabbas is among the most striking and most inexplicable. Something would clearly seem to lie behind so clumsy and confusing a fabrication. One modern writer has proposed an intriguing and plausible explanation. He suggests that Barabbas was the son of Jesus and Jesus a legitimate king. If this were the case, the choice of Barabbas would suddenly make sense. One must imagine an oppressed populace confronted with the imminent extermination of their spiritual and political ruler the Messiah, whose advent had formerly promised so much. In such circumstances, would not the dynasty be more important than the individual? Would not the preservation of the bloodline be paramount, taking precedence over everything else? Would not a people, faced with the dreadful choice, prefer to see their king sacrificed in order that his offspring and his line might survive? If the line survived, there would at least be hope for the future. It is certainly not impossible that Barabbas was Jesus's son. 
Jesus is generally believed to have been born around 6 BC. The crucifixion occurred no later than AD 36, which would make Jesus, at most, 42 years of age. But even if he was only 33 when he died, he might still have fathered a son. In accordance with the customs of the time, he might have married as early as 16 or 17. Yet even if he did not marry until age 20, he might still have had a son aged 13 who, by Judaic custom, would have been considered a man. And of course, there may well have been other children too. Such children could have been conceived at any point up to within a day or so of the crucifixion. The crucifixion in detail. 7. Jesus could well have sired a number of children prior to the crucifixion. If he survived the crucifixion however, the likelihood of offspring would be still further increased. Is there any evidence that Jesus did indeed survive the crucifixion, or that the crucifixion was in some way a fraud? Given the portrait of him in the Gospels, it is inexplicable that Jesus was crucified at all. According to the Gospels, his enemies were the established Jewish interests in Jerusalem. But such enemies, if they in fact existed, could have stoned him to death of their own accord and on their own authority, without involving Rome in the matter. According to the Gospels, Jesus had no particular quarrel with Rome and did not violate Roman law. And yet he was punished by the Romans, in accordance with Roman law and Roman procedures. And he was punished by crucifixion a penalty exclusively reserved for those guilty of crimes against the empire. If Jesus was indeed crucified, he cannot have been as apolitical as the Gospels depict him. On the contrary, he must, of necessity, have done something to provoke Roman as opposed to Jewish wrath. Whatever the trespasses for which Jesus was crucified, his apparent death on the cross is fraught with inconsistencies. There is, quite simply, no reason why his crucifixion, as the Gospels depict it, should have been fatal. The contention that it was warrants closer scrutiny. The Roman practice of crucifixion adhered to very precise procedures. After sentence a victim would be flogged and consequently weakened by loss of blood. His outstretched arms would then be fastened usually by thongs, but sometimes by nails to a heavy wooden beam placed horizontally across his neck and shoulders. Bearing this beam, he would then be led to the place of execution. Here, with the victim hanging from it, the beam would be raised and attached to a vertical post or stake. Hanging thus from his hands, it would be impossible for the victim to breathe unless his feet were also fixed to the cross, thus enabling him to press down on them and relieve the pressure on his chest. But, despite the agony, a man suspended with his feet fixed, and especially a fit and healthy man would usually survive for at least a day or two. Indeed, the victim would often take as much as a week to die from exhaustion, from thirst, or, if nails were used, from blood poisoning. The attenuated agony could be terminated more quickly by breaking the victim's legs or knees which, in the Gospels, Jesus' executioners are about to do before they are forestalled. Breaking of the legs or knees was not an additional sadistic torment. On the contrary, it was an act of mercy a coup de grace which caused a very rapid death. With nothing to support him, the pressure on the victim's chest would become intolerable, and he would quickly asphyxiate. There is consensus among modern scholars that only the fourth gospel rests on an eyewitness account of the crucifixion. According to the fourth gospel, Jesus' feet were affixed to the cross thus relieving the pressure on his chest muscles and his legs were not broken. He should therefore, in theory at least, have survived for a good two or three days. And yet he is on the cross for no more than a few hours before being pronounced dead. In the Gospel of Mark, even Pilate is astonished by the rapidity with which death occurs, Mark 15 verse 44. What can have constituted the cause of death? Not the spear in his side, for the fourth gospel maintains that Jesus was already dead when this wound was inflicted on him. John 19 verse 33, there is only one explanation a combination of exhaustion, fatigue, general debilitation, and the trauma of the scourging. But not even these factors should have proved fatal so soon. It is possible, of course, that they did despite the laws of physiology, a man will sometimes die from a single relatively innocuous blow. But there would still seem to be something suspicious about the affair. According to the fourth gospel, Jesus' executioners are on the verge of breaking his legs, thus accelerating his death. Why bother, if he was already moribund? 
There would, in short, be no point in breaking Jesus' legs unless death were not in fact imminent. In the Gospels Jesus' death occurs at a moment that is almost too convenient, too felicitously opportune. It occurs just in time to prevent his executioners breaking his legs. And by doing so, it permits him to fulfill an Old Testament prophecy. Modern authorities agree that Jesus, quite unabashedly, modeled and perhaps contrived his life in accordance with such prophecies, which heralded the coming of a Messiah. It was for this reason that an ass had to be procured from Bethany on which he could make his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And the details of the crucifixion seem likewise engineered to enact the prophecies of the Old Testament. In short Jesus is apparent and opportune demise which, in the nick of time, saves him from certain death and enables him to fulfill a prophecy is, to say the least, suspect. It is too perfect, too precise to be coincidence. It must either be a later interpolation after the fact, or part of a carefully contrived plan. There is much additional evidence to suggest the latter. In the fourth gospel Jesus, hanging on the cross, declares that he thirsts. In reply to this complaint he is proffered a sponge allegedly soaked in vinegar an incident that also occurs in the other Gospels. This sponge is generally interpreted as another act of sadistic derision. But was it really? Vinegar or soured wine is a temporary stimulant, with effects not unlike smelling salts. It was often used at the time to resuscitate flagging slaves on galleys. For a wounded and exhausted man, a sniff or taste of vinegar would induce a restorative effect, a momentary surge of energy. And yet in Jesus's case, the effect is just the contrary. No sooner does he inhale or taste the sponge than he pronounces his final words and gives up the ghost. Such a reaction to vinegar is physiologically inexplicable. On the other hand such a reaction would be perfectly compatible with a sponge soaked not in vinegar, but in some type of soporific drug a compound of opium and herbelladonna, for instance commonly employed in the Middle East at the time. But why proffer a soporific drug? Unless the act of doing so, along with all the other components of the crucifixion, were elements of a complex and ingenious stratagem a stratagem designed to produce a semblance of death when the victim, in fact, was still alive. Such a stratagem would not only have saved Jesus's life, but also have realized the Old Testament prophecies of a Messiah. There are other anomalous aspects of the crucifixion which point to precisely such a stratagem. According to the Gospels Jesus is crucified at a place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. Later tradition attempts to identify Golgotha as a barren, more or less skull-shaped hill to the northwest of Jerusalem. And yet the Gospels themselves make it clear that the site of the crucifixion is very different from a barren skull-shaped hill. The fourth Gospel is most explicit on the matter. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre, wherein was never man yet laid. John 19 verse 41, Jesus, then, was crucified not on a barren skull-shaped hill, nor, for that matter, in any public place of execution. He was crucified in or immediately adjacent to a garden containing a private tomb. According to Matthew 27 60, this tomb and garden were the personal property of Joseph of Arimathea who, according to all four Gospels, was both a man of wealth and a secret disciple of Jesus. Popular tradition depicts the crucifixion as a large-scale public affair, accessible to the multitude and attended by a cast of thousands. And yet the Gospels themselves suggest very different circumstances. According to Matthew, Mark and Luke, the crucifixion is witnessed by most people, including the women, from afar off, Luke 23 verse 49. It would thus seem clear that Jesus' death was not a public event, but a private one a private crucifixion performed on private property. A number of modern scholars argue that the actual site was probably the Garden of Gethsemane. If Gethsemane were indeed the private land of one of Jesus' secret disciples, this would explain why Jesus, prior to the crucifixion, could make such free use of the place. Needless to say a private crucifixion on private property leaves considerable room for a hoax a mock crucifixion, a skillfully stage-managed ritual. There would have been only a few eyewitnesses immediately present. To the general populace the drama would only have been visible, as the synoptic gospels confirm, from some distance. And from such a distance it would not have been apparent who in fact was being crucified. Or if he was actually dead. 
such a charade would, of course, have necessitated some connivance and collusion on the part of Pontius Pilate or of someone influential in the Roman administration. And indeed such connivance and collusion is highly probable. Granted, Pilate was a cruel and tyrannical man. But he was also corrupt and susceptible to bribes. The historical Pilate, as opposed to the one depicted in the Gospels, would not have been above sparing Jesus's life in exchange for a sizable sum of money and perhaps a guarantee of no further political agitation. Whatever his motivation, there is, in any case, no question that Pilate is somehow intimately involved in the affair. He acknowledges Jesus's claim as king of the Jews. He also expresses, or feigns to express, surprise that Jesus's death occurs as quickly as it apparently does. And, perhaps most important of all, he grants Jesus's body to Joseph of Arimathea. According to Roman law at the time, a crucified man was denied all burial. Indeed guards were customarily posted to prevent relatives or friends removing the bodies of the dead. The victim would simply be left on the cross, at the mercy of the elements and carrion birds. Yet Pilate, in a flagrant breach of procedure, readily grants Jesus's body to Joseph of Arimathea. This clearly attests to some complicity on Pilate's part. And it may attest to other things as well. In English translations of Mark's Gospel Joseph asks Pilate for Jesus's body. Pilate expresses surprise that Jesus is dead, checks with a centurion, then, satisfied, consents to Joseph's request. This would appear straightforward enough at first glance, but in the original Greek version of Mark's Gospel, the matter becomes rather more complicated. In the Greek version when Joseph asks for Jesus's body, he uses the word soma a word applied only to a living body. Pilate, assenting to the request, employs the word toma which means corpse. According to the Greek, then, Joseph explicitly asks for a living body and Pilate grants him what he thinks, or pretends to think, is a dead one. Given the prohibition against burying crucified men, it is also extraordinary that Joseph receives anybody at all. On what grounds does he receive it? What claim does he have to Jesus' body? If he was a secret disciple, he could hardly plead any claim without disclosing his secret discipleship unless Pilate was already aware of it, or unless there was some other factor involved which militated in Joseph's favor. There is little information about Joseph of Arimathea. The Gospels report only that he was a secret disciple of Jesus, possessed great wealth, and belonged to the Sanhedrin the Council of Elders which ruled the Judaic community of Jerusalem under Roman auspices. It would thus seem apparent that Joseph was an influential man. And this conclusion receives confirmation from his dealings with Pilate, and from the fact that he possesses a tract of land with a private tomb. Medieval tradition portrays Joseph of Arimathea as a custodian of the Holy Grail, and Perseval is said to be of his lineage. According to other later traditions, he is in some way related by blood to Jesus and Jesus's family. If this was indeed the case, it would, at very least, have furnished him with some plausible claim to Jesus's body for, while Pilate would hardly grant the corpse of an executed criminal to a random stranger, he might well do so, with the incentive of a bribe, to the dead man's kin. If Joseph a wealthy and influential member of the Sanhedrin was indeed Jesus's kin, he bears further testimony to Jesus's aristocratic pedigree. And if he was Jesus's kin, his association with the Holy Grail the Blood Royal would be all the more explicable. The Scenario We had already sketched a tentative hypothesis which proposed a bloodline descended from Jesus. We now began to enlarge on that hypothesis, and albeit still provisionally fill in a number of crucial details. As we did so, the overall picture began to gain both coherence and plausibility. It seemed increasingly clear that Jesus was a priest king and aristocrat and legitimate claimant to the throne embarking on an attempt to regain his rightful heritage. He himself would have been a native of Galilee, a traditional hotbed of opposition to the Roman regime. At the same time, he would have had numerous noble, rich and influential supporters throughout Palestine, including the capital city of Jerusalem, and one of these supporters, a powerful member of the Sanhedrin, may also have been his kin. In the Jerusalem suburb of Bethany, moreover, was the home of either his wife or his wife's family, and here, on the eve of his triumphal entry into the capital, the aspiring priest-king resided. 
Here he established the center for his mystery cult. Here he augmented his following by performing ritual initiations, including that of his brother-in-law. Such an aspiring priest king would have generated powerful opposition in certain quarters inevitably among the Roman administration and perhaps among entrenched Judaic interests represented by the Sadducees. One or both of these interests apparently contrived to thwart his bid for the throne. But in their attempt to exterminate him they were not as successful as they had hoped to be. For the priest king would seem to have had friends in high places, and these friends, working in collusion with a corrupt, easily bribed Roman procurator, appear to have engineered a mock crucifixion on private grounds, inaccessible to all but a select few. With the general populace kept at a convenient distance, an execution was then staged in which a substitute took the priest king's place on the cross, or in which the priest king himself did not actually die. Towards dusk which would have further impeded visibility a body was removed to an opportunely adjacent tomb, from which, a day or two later, it miraculously disappeared. If our scenario was accurate, where did Jesus go then? So far as our hypothesis of a bloodline was concerned, the answer to that question did not particularly matter. According to certain Islamic and Indian legends, he eventually died at a ripe old age, somewhere in the east in Kashmir, it is claimed most frequently. According to the letter we received, the documents found by Berenger Saunier at Ren Le Chateau contained incontrovertible proof that Jesus was alive in AD 45, but there is no indication as to where. One likely possibility would be Egypt, and specifically Alexandria where, at about the same time, the sage Ormus is said to have created the Rose Croix by amalgamating Christianity with earlier, pre-Christian mysteries. It has even been hinted that Jesus's mummified body may be concealed somewhere in the environs of Ren Le Chateau which would explain the ciphered message in Saunier's parchments ILESTLA Mort, he is there dead. We are not prepared to assert that he accompanied his family to Marseilles. In fact, circumstances would argue against it. He might not have been in any condition to travel, and his presence would have constituted a threat to his relative's safety. He may have deemed it more important to remain in the Holy Land like his brother, St. James to pursue his objectives there. In short, we can offer no real suggestion about what became of him any more than the Gospels themselves do. For the purposes of our hypothesis, however, what happened to Jesus was of less importance than what happened to the Holy Family and especially to his brother-in-law, his wife and his children. If our scenario was correct, they, together with Joseph of Arimathea and certain others, were smuggled by ship from the Holy Land. And when they were set ashore at Marseilles, the Magdalene would indeed have brought the Sangral the Blood Royal, the scion of the House of David into France. In researching his book, The Hidden Tradition in Europe, Yuri Stoyanov came across an extraordinary and provocative document. This document consists of a detailed account of Kathar beliefs, particularly in the Languedoc. It was compiled by a Catholic writer perhaps a priest who had infiltrated high-level Kathar circles and been present at teaching sessions for initiates. In these sessions, secret and potentially explosive material was passed on to aspiring parfaits. According to the document Yuri Stoyanov discovered, the Cathars clandestinely taught that Jesus was indeed married to the Magdalene. In his book, as well as in conversations with us, Yuri Stoyanov has stressed the uniqueness of the Cathar insistence on a marriage between Jesus and the Magdalene. It does not exist, he notes, among the Bogomils, the dualist heretics from Eastern Europe, believed by many to be the source of Cathar beliefs. This would seem to confirm our own conclusions that the Cathars did not in fact derive from the Bogomils, but were indigenous to the region of the Pyrenees and the south of France. If the Magdalene, with Jesus' offspring, did find refuge with a Judaic community in that region, some knowledge of the circumstances might well have filtered down through the centuries into Cathar tradition. But it would not initially have been known to the Bogomils of Eastern Europe, who embraced a similar theological creed. The Crusades, of course, inaugurated new contacts between East and West, and new cross-fertilizations. At this point, Cathar and Bogomil teachings began to converge. Only then would the Bogomils have become privy to what Cathar tradition had inherited.